Hey everybody, it's uh, it's Andy Rose here again. Uh, another interview, another day, trying to get information out in our new normal. Um, I'm here today with uh, Jason Anapatardi. He's running for uh, District 31 for the State House, um, covering State mostly Senate. Paulding <laughs> and, uh, and and other parts of uh, Northwest Georgia. So, uh, Jason, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, Andy. Hey, everyone. This is Jason Anapatardi. Um, if you're in Paulding County, I am running for uh, Senate District 31 um, here in West Georgia. That's Paulding, Polk, and Harrelson County. And uh, we've lived out here for about 13 years. Uh, married, have three daughters um, here in the Paulding County school system, uh, where I was lucky enough to serve on the Paulding County School Board. And um, just love this part of the state, love our county, and um, love our friends and neighbors and people we get to spend time with. So, so. It's a good time. Yeah, it's a it's it's a good time. It's a it's an unusual time with uh, COVID nineteen going on, uh, and that's yep. essentially why we're doing this the Zoom call is to <clears throat> have these conversations uh, about how how everybody's handling it. And as you as um, and <clears throat> working for a business and running a campaign, uh, what are, what are you guys doing right now, um, and how are you handling the new normal of of all this with COVID-19 shelter in place and all the uh, restrictions we have. Yeah, I mean, the new normal is kind of, you know, it's, I, I don't know how to say it, but I, my friends and I, as we've talked about, it's just, we're really, really living through this biblical time right now. And I really believe that you, today is not gonna be the same as tomorrow, and tomorrow is not gonna be the same as the next day. And I think that, um, you know, and, and Andy, you can relate. I mean, if if you've got uh, young kids or older kids and, you know, they're here in, here in the house and um, probably typically they're at school or they're somewhere um, yeah. getting their education. And we've even, I know of even some friends and you probably have friends that um, have college students that are, you know, the, the safe place for them to be right now is kind of with mom and dad or guardian um, at their place. Right. Right. Um, you know, so it's a different dynamic. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of old school in the sense that it reminds me of kind of my upbringing where, you know, family was everything and me and my brother and parents, we would hang out and, you know, do everything almost literally every single day. Um, and I think for, you know, what we're living through right now, um, I think, you know, the, the silver lining and the positive part of it is, you know, it's bringing families in some cases, I want to say back together, but um, it's allowing for that quality time that, you know, I think many of us and, you know, even myself, I'm guilty of it. Um, you know, the hustle and bustle and running around between work and sports and activities and um, hanging out with friends and neighbors and all those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, kind of keeping us focused on um, one another. And, and I think there's a lot of neighbors in need, not just in this community, but across the state. Um, where I've, I have friends of mine who have been sick with COVID, almost died of COVID, um, wow. you know, family members who have um, encountered other um, individuals with COVID um, and waiting to see if maybe they have it themselves. Um, so I think this is, you know, this has impacted everyone in, in you know, kind of a big or small way. <laughs> um, obviously, it's had a tremendous impact on the, the local economy. And I thank you for setting up these uh, meetings to kind of hear from, you know, not people like me, but really business owners and people that really kind of hear, <clears throat> you know, their testimonials of what they're living through right now and having to shift hours or close or lay off employees. And, and I've got many friends of mine whose businesses are on the blink, brink of losing everything or have already lost everything. And now they're scrounging around trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next? um in order to survive and, and i think even though um you know the trump administration has really put an influx of uh you know funding into the economy to help individuals and small business owners you know there still is a lag time before that money starts really hitting and i think some of the community banks and others have um you know started seeing that money starting to kind of roll down to where they can help their local communities um but i think it's going to take a minute before it really has the impact that you know we all hope it does um but i think right now you know these times we're living in i mean really it's it's kind of going back to 
um, kind of core fundamental values and core fundamental things that, you know, we need to be doing. And um, it's, you know, and I, and I can relate to the, you know, the stress that parents have that, you know, haven't been, you know, necessarily know how to homeschool their, their son or daughter and, and balance work. And I think all those things are kind of playing out into the house that I think um, maybe many people aren't thinking about. And then on the flip side of that, all of these teachers who are used to doing lesson planning and everything else and go into a, a physical building, um, you know, trying to make sure that their kids are being educated, um, working with the parents. Um, so they're able to keep seeing that, you know, progress, um, which right now, I mean, it's kind of flipped on a dime um, on its head for, for many of us. And, right. you know, well, you know, that's what I said. I think it's a day by day thing. I don't think anybody can predict what's going to happen two weeks from now versus 30 days from now or six months from now. I mean, I think it's all we can do is take right. it one day at a time. And I think, I think you're right. This has slowed things down. I've, I've had other conversations with folks um, <clears throat> and, and trying to set more of these up. And uh, I think really it is, uh, you know, having my faith and knowing that no matter what we'll get through it. But <clears throat> um, I think, I think really God's given us an opportunity to slow things down and refocus our lives because we have for the last couple of decades have just sped through so much, you know, information mm -hmm. comes at us at a thousand miles an hour and we don't even get a chance to process all of it. And here we are, all we have to, time to do now is to process information and our process picker, I mean, our, our information picker is, is off because we want to see everything. And <clears throat> there's so much information out there that we don't need to focus on all the information. We need to focus on a few things, um, you know, family, faith, uh, and then what, what is, what are we dealing with right now in this moment? <clears throat> and I think that's really, um, part of the reason that we're going through some of this stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, you can think of whatever grand conspiracy of how, how and why all this stuff is playing out the way it is. Right. One way or another, you've got to look at this from the perspective. And, and my mindset is we, we're here for a reason. Let's figure out what the positivities are, what's the silver linings, what's the lessons learned, and how can we move forward? Yeah, and I, yeah, and I think on an individual level, to your point, it's, you know, it's, it's all about, I think, listening and, and being obedient. And I think those are two strong character traits, whether – you may believe you have them or not, and none of us are perfect, but I think those are the, the, the oppor that's the opportunity I think all of us have to kind of work towards, you know, kind of day in and day out as we're kind of, you know, oppressed with whatever the, you know, the challenge is and whether that's a challenge um, of this quote unquote new norm. Is it the challenge of, you know, the financial and economic crisis? Um, you know, is that, you know, the challenge of, you know, um, you know, the relationship, you know, you have with your kids, you know, your friends, your wife, whatever. And so, um, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to say right now, is, you know, it's a big test, but, you know, I think it's an opportunity for, for all of us to, I think, um, you know, just work hard, you know, I think, um, you know, become closer with the Lord um, and our families, and, and we should be taking advantage of that you know, this time right now, as much as we, we can. So. Take your sounds off. Thanks. So I was looking over a list of questions. I, I muted it because I'm coughing because of my allergies. So, no, you're fine. Um, so, hey, that's cough, what we're doing. Hey, it's natural. Yeah, it's okay. It happens. It is. So um, what needs do you see in your business? I, like I was saying when I was muted that, you know, you're coming out of the school board. So I, I know you're coming out of that so you can run your campaign. And in your own job uh, currently right now, what needs are you seeing out there um, that folks are needing, uh, and not just for employment and business, but I know you're, you're reached out to a lot of people, you're talking to a lot of people, especially with running the campaign. What needs are you seeing so, out there for everybody? Yeah, I mean, so there's, I mean, there's, there's several, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a laundry list. Um, I think, 
one, one opportunity or one thing I've been able to be involved with amongst many. Um, and this is really right now kind of, you got to look at this through a lens of, <clears throat> excuse me, now I'm coughing, Andy. Um, drinking, you know, really drinking through the, like <clears throat> drinking out of a fire hose or a fire hydrant. Right. And literally there's no, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with a plan when every, every day is evolving. And I think, you know, it's trying to put fires out, but then it's putting, trying to put in mitigation um, practices to, to help people, help communities. I mean, we're literally, I think all of us, whether it's you, me, our neighbors, we're, we're in this emergency response time where um, all of us in some small way are, 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 are saving lives. Right. Not like our frontline workers, not like our public safety workers, our doctors, our nurses who are literally um, putting their lives on the line every single day. But we all have to do our part. And I think um, one of the big needs I've seen is, for example, for, other, for those frontline workers, for those public safety workers, those nurses, the many of the hospitals, you know, West Georgia, across Metro Atlanta, across the state is, um, if, if the, all of these individuals are to get to work to help our fellow neighbors, um, one, one issue has been childcare. Um, and wow. yeah. schools are closed. Um, you know, so it's a whole different dynamic, like nobody's ever dreamed of before. So um, being able to work with some of my friends at the YMCA, um, helping them and advising them on how to create a, a childcare program like probably no one has ever seen before to basically just focus on those frontline workers in the hospitals um, and public safety here in our community and other communities. Um, right. Just really spoke kind of, I think, to the, to the, to the need and the urgency of kind of what's going on with COVID um, on the front lines and, um, and the financial pressures that a lot of these organizations, whether you're a nonprofit organization or you're a hospital that you're under right now, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty tremendous. The other part of this is, is, uh, is food. And, you know, a lot of, I mean, we all can joke that all this food's flying off the grocery store shelves and everything else, Yeah. but there's a lot of families that, um, who have children who relied on, you know, going to school so every day and yeah. they would get a meal. And so I do yeah, want to I mean, praise. You got there on the bus, you were, you got there early enough, you were able to get breakfast and lunch. That's right. Um, and that's that when I was talking to to Matt on my previous interview. He's working with Kaya, and mm -hmm. they're having needs. You know, it, he's not allowed to go in and bulk buy like he normally would, and uh, not even for a charity. You know, so yeah, and it's a and it's a, it's that. a tremendous challenge, and 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 so you know, I know the Paulding County School District, for example, and there's other school districts who have done this. Um, <clears throat> you know, they've they've set up <clears throat> stations at many of the other many of the schools. So people can come and pick up lunches. So I do want to give credit to my uh, my former colleagues on the school board and and our school district for kind of stepping up and um, you know staying true to that and, and working through those challenges every single right. day. But I think the need is much greater. I think it's it's a it's a tremendous problem. I think even to what you said about you know buying in bulk, a lot of food banks around the state. Um, they're having that challenge right now, and it, and it's kind of a twofold challenge. I'm sure Kaya's feeling this too, where it's 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 not just getting your hands on you know the food to dis to dis distribute. That's not even a word, distribute. <laughs> but it's okay. But also, but but also too the 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 financial aspect of it, um, where I think it's a very difficult time where nonprofits are aren't seeing the money and donations come in the door like they typically would because of the crisis that's going on uh, right. with the economy um so it's a double-edged sword um but i think we have to keep finding businesses and leaders to keep working at it um i think to really help you know help with that situation and going back to the school district too um from talking to some of my former colleagues and, and teachers you know I, I know the paulding county school district has probably given out and I think the last number I was told somewhere between six and 700 technology devices um, to kids that came to school and that was how they accessed technology. Right. Um, you know, they don't have, you know, um, wireless in their community or broadband or internet, um, but, or just the simple fact that they don't own a computer, they don't own a laptop, 
but maybe they can access wireless and broadband. Um, and all of the schools, like in Paulding County, for example, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're wired as, as wired can be. And Julie Ragsdale on that team has always done a really good job um, on the technology yeah. side. But, but again, it just speaks to, again, the challenge and, and the, you know, what is this quote unquote normal, you know, world we're living in is that if you have a family that can't access food, they can't access the internet to educate their kids or even just to get general information on what's going on. Um, you know, that's a, you know, it's, it, and the economy is doing what it's doing. It, it starts becoming a, a pretty dire situation um, that, right. you know, we need to be concerned about. <clears throat> I, you know, I think on the back side of all this, though, that there's going to be, we don't know. I don't want to worry about the future, even though you got to you mm -hmm. know, keep looking out for it. But I think on the back side of this, there's going to be opportunities, new opportunities that were never oh, totally. there before that is going to help. You know, some of these entrepreneurs that, business owners that may say, okay, I've lost my business because of all this. But I think there's going to be plenty of those those folks that are able to do something on the back side of this and fill a uh, fill a gap, a gap that wasn't there before. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They they find something, mm -hmm. they find a need, you know, create it, create and create something to fill that need. And you know, there's going to be new needs on the back side. And whether it's education, whether it's charity, whether it's you know delivering a food, uh, I, I, we look at this through this opportunity. You know, you know our struggles with. Uh, with our son, with uh, his autism and everything, and, and the issues we've had with uh, with with his learning <clears throat> learning disabilities, we've actually got good information and good data through this with what he's been able to do and learn. Um, and, and so we're going to try to take that forward, and we've already started taking steps with with some discussions. Um, <clears throat> so it, with with. That being said, you know, what lessons uh, would you take forward into the future to merge into our new normal that you're already seeing? I mean, I mean, one, I mean, one, no, I, I'll give you one. I mean, and, and, and it's kind of to your point, Andy, what, you know, what is this new economy going to look like? Because it is going to be in some place, in some ways, in some industries, it could be drastically different. Right. I mean, there may be some industries that do not <clears throat> recover maybe at the rate that, you know, we hope they do. Right. Um, and so I think it's kind of, you know, as we identify what are those barriers right now and lessons learned, I mean, I could give you one that um, I've worked on for, you know, the last few years. And I know there's a big struggle with right now, just with, with doctors is around telehealth. And, you know, you, you have, you know, you know, I've been a big, big advocate of telehealth, supporter of telehealth, um, um, and worked with a lot of those leaders across the state. And, Right now, at this moment, more than ever, um, you're asking, you know, we have providers um, and doctors that maybe don't have access to the technology, which is simply getting, you know, kind of the software license and those types of things um, to create the access for their patients. Because some doctors, because of everything going on, <clears throat> could be on the verge of closing do their doors. Um, right. But I think seeing the greater need for investment into those types of programs. Um, so that when there's an emergency, you don't have a, a doctor's office really, you know, trying to struggle to figure out, okay, how do I get access to the technology? How do I build the technology so it's operational? And then right. at the same time, my patients can hopefully connect to the technology, you know, if they have access to a smartphone or, or something else. So they can do that, you know, doctor consultation um, right. virtually, like you and I are talking right now. And I think that's a huge lesson learned and, you know, and I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm very supportive of that. Hopefully we're going to see greater investment um, into those types of technologies. And, and there's a way to, to form public private partnerships um, down the road to address, address this need. And this is a big issue, obviously in rural Georgia, um, but right. this is a big issue kind of across the state, even in, um, suburban parts of, of Metro Atlanta where um, you have nurses and doctors who haven't been exposed to telehealth, um, maybe haven't had that training um, and it's still new to them. So um, I don't, it's, it's, it's a big issue for rural Georgia. Um, that's where I think it's, it has the greatest opportunity and need. Um, but I think we have to look at also too, how, how are we going to create um, a operational network that 
um, citizens will have access to and benefit from, um, you know, especially during these times or even what quote unquote normal times. So I think that's, right. that's one huge opportunity right there is, you know, how do we leverage technology and it truly do make Georgia the, the technology capital of the East coast. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there'll be, like I said, so much, so much born out of this. Um, we're, you know, with, like I was saying with our son, we were looking at the possibilities of, um, what can how can this help us you know we've we've got a w wide range of kids here <laughs> i've got a graduating senior i've got a sophomore and then i've got two kids in elementary school and they're completely different on their education and education levels um but what can you know this school from home you know what what is that going to do for the future you know yeah it's it's um, an interesting it's an interesting dynamic because um I mean, you, you, this may be a situation where we find more parents wanting to homeschool their kids. Right. Um, this may be an opportunity where school districts need to have conversations with the community and talk about, you know, are there other flexibilities that need to be built into the education system um, in right. terms of, you know, how we teach. We kind of, over the last few years, we've, we've already started doing that with dual enrollment, for example, um, online classes at, at um, you know, our colleges and universities. I chair the board of trustees at Chattahoochee Technical College. Um, our right. number one class that people enroll with um, over at the tech, technical college is basically our online classes. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see as, as we open up our um, brick and mortar buildings, um, you know, hopefully as the virus kind of goes away, um, what enrollment is going to look like um, and who's in, and who's enrolling? I mean, I know after the you know the the financial crisis of 07, 08, um, a, there there was no quote unquote stereotypical student. I mean, it was it was individuals who were on the verge of graduating high school and college, and yeah. there were and then there were people who were going back and and getting a certificate or wanting to get um, another level of education so that they could find a job and become employable. Um, and some individuals, right, and this is, you know, individuals that, you know, right before they're uh, already ready to retire. Right. And, um, <laughs> and so I don't know if, if we're going to see something similar to that experience in 07, 08, um, or it's going to be that with, um, I think, the new dynamics that you mentioned in terms of kind of what, you know, what, what are the, what is the new economy? Um, I think that, you know, the things that, trade trade jobs trade skills that i'm proud that we support around welding and truck driving and all those types of things i think become even more relevant um in the new economy more than ever um and you know i'm, I'm hopeful that you know as we look at you know funding priorities um going forward i think again i've said this before and you've heard me say this is education is the center of our universe if we want industry growth, economic development, and everything else. And I think unless right. we're doing that, um, I think how we rebound out of this economy, um, you know, it's going to be essential that we, we put the right strategies in place to, to be successful, especially here in West Georgia, where I know we've struggled bringing industry um, to many of the counties here in, in West Georgia for a long period of time. And, and, and hopefully, um, you know, with new leadership and, and, uh, you know, looking at, you know, what are the opportunities to succeed from this horrible crisis we're in right now, um, we'll be able to do that. I, I wonder, I know, I've thought about this in a business aspect, but also you can apply it to the school, uh, where some businesses may realize that they don't need all those locations. They may only need one or two sure. locations and, and stay very wide range regional wise. And they may shut down and say, hey, you guys can work from home. You know, right. um, and you can do things like these Zoom meetings and whatnot, and you can still do everything virtually as long as you have the backbone to do so. And that backbone is likely uh, less expensive than it is to hold a physical location for some of these businesses. I think some of the business owners are learning that, <clears throat> and that's a place where they can maybe cut costs immediately or in the future. What does that look like? We, we're not sure yet, but also you can apply that to the schools where um we have you know here in the north side of paulding county we have a lot of overcrowding 
what if you had an opportunity to say, hey, you can go to, you can do this all from home and they have a live feed like this for the class that they want to sit in on. They would normally be at the school or there's already a pre-recorded one that they can watch, get the instruction that they need and be able to sit one-on-one with a teacher, maybe a designated Mm -hmm. teacher each day for any kind of tutoring or something like that, but be able to do that. And that could fix the overcrowding that we have, especially at the North campus. You know, we we know how the traffic and the overcrowding (laughs) is over there and some of the steps that the county has tried to take to alleviate that stuff. And a lot of that has to do with the East Ross and money and moving money around and property and all that stuff. But I think that would be a quicker, more effective and less uh, expensive fix than building a brand new school potentially. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I think there definitely is going to have to be, (laughs) there's going to have to be some very innovative strategies. I think in terms of, alleviating the crowd, the overcrowding. But I think also from a, a school class setting, I mean, I think that the environment we're in right now is it's, it's very kind of reactionary and, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what the plans are for um, when school goes back into the fall um, and, and how it looks, but I don't know that it could totally be as traditional as I think we're all used to in some ways. Um, I think there has to be, which I think Paulding County leverages a lot of technology, but I think we. All right, here we, here we go again. Uh, We got cut off, uh, you know, technology, you know, it's great, Um, (laughs) but it has its, uh, has its issues. So we're back. Uh, Jason, you were talking about going into the future with, with schools and how that looks in you know, do we have classrooms? Do we have remote classrooms? Do this from a classroom. There's a teacher at the school and there's a kid sitting here at a computer learning and stuff. And if that's, that's a viable thing to do with our virtual academy that we have now, I think it's an opportunity that we could take. One thing that I was thinking about while you were talking was that we've had, being in real estate myself, we've had major disruptors. You know, we've had um, all those big uh, companies come along from from the West Coast and and have disrupted it, whether it's Open Door, Zillow, and, and all of those, they've been disruptors and they've made us change the way we do things. And I remember, I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk, I'm a huge Gary, Vayner, Gary Vaynerchuk fan, and, he, and he's, he basically said one time in a speech is that the internet takes, it, it eliminates the middleman. The internet eliminates the middleman. So what are we able to eliminate here? What middle piece are we able to eliminate here with schools? How can we disrupt schools in a positive way so that benefits as many people as possible uh, for, for public education? You know, what, what does that look like? What could that look like? And like I said, we can apply this from business as well. Some of those buildings that they're at, some of those offices that they're at, they could probably be eliminated. And, you know, you cut, you cut away the overhead on all that stuff, the, some of these companies would be able to, you know, suffer through some times like these, you know, although this is definitely an odd time, um, they could, they could definitely make it through this and have more money in the bank to get by. So, yeah. And, and I think, and, and I think there is a differentiator between, you know, kind of, you know, those, those, those hard capital expense expenditures and, and then expenditures, you know, were, we're really kind of sinking into the individuals and, and people in our workforce. And I think that's the opportunity. One of the opportunities I see here is, you know, how do we drive greater investment um, into our teachers and staff? Um, you know, cause let's be honest. I mean, many of them, if not all of them, maybe they have, you know, some semblance of how to use technology and how to be creative with technology, but maybe here's an opportunity that, um, you know, we're able to, train our, our teachers and give them, you know, more resources to, you know, allow them to be more creative and innovative of what they're doing in the classroom or, or, or maybe even move to teaching in a virtual <laughs> setting like you and I are today um, to some of our students, um, you know, particularly at the high school level where um, some of them may be already getting exposed to that as they're, you know, starting to, you know, put their toe in the water and in a college environment um, with online classes or dual enrollment and those types of things. Um, 
so I, and I know when I was on the school board, that was one of the main things we, one of the big things we talked about is, you know, is, is greater investment into people and our workforce is only so great as, as we're willing to invest. And I yeah. think, um, you know, a lot of times we talk about teacher pay raises and we talk about those types of things, but what are the other things that we need to do to make a teacher's life easier in the classroom in in that classroom environment? And, and as you and I've talked about, that could be something as simple as just, um, you know, the amount of supplies they have to buy and the stresses that come with that and, and, and scrounging up enough stuff to, you know, be able to do their, their job on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but then what are those other tangible elements that, you know, maybe it's more technology or more, maybe it's more something else um, that um, they, they just don't have access to. And hopefully there's maybe some environment we're, we're living in um, that really start allowing us to kind of plot out what are those strategies that um, we can help teachers and, and even and even going back to what we talked about before our frontline workers with um, you know our, our public safety and, and firefighter and police officers and paramedics and <clears throat> nurses and doctors and and, and, and what should um, that entire um, you know almost you know for low-income families you know that safety net system but also too, you know the 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 system in terms of you know them being able to save lives and and and, and what are the other investments we need to be prepared for for down the road if if um if we experience this again or or some sort of other um you know national crisis um here in our state um and and i and i think that's what we need to be thinking about um and the implications to that related to the financial impact, but the human impact. Yeah, and, and I think I think as a as a country as a whole, I mean, this, the way this country was started, you know, it, it, we're resilient, you know, we're innovative, right. and and a lot of times we're quick to to make the changes needed to <clears throat> keep this thing moving, <laughs> you know, for better or worse. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but um, we're we're able to do that in this country, uh, mostly because of how our constitution is structured and all that stuff, but also because the people are, more people are, are open to those necessary changes when they're needed. Um, right. Uh, so with, with, with that, you know, uh, what, who do you think has done a, a great job, whether it's, it's city, county, you know, uh, state level, um, or even national, who do you think uh, in, in our leadership, uh, as far as business and politics, <laughs> who do you think has done a great job? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and give a scorecard to, on everybody, but I mean, I think under the circumstances of, you know, I mean, let's be frank, I don't think anybody we know has ever experienced anything like this in our lifetime. And I think under those circumstances, I think President Trump has done everything humanly possible that he's able to do and he's doing right now, I think, to protect the country, to make sure we're safe, to work with the private sector to, um, you know, make sure ventilators are being built. Um, we're getting the necessary supplies to, you know, different parts of the country um, that we need and really solve this problem and solve it, you know, in a kind of a, um, in a definite manner um, for the future. Um, and, you know, and I, and, and I think the other part of this too is, um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, just negative, whatever you want to call it towards some state leaders and, and whether they think, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, it's, it's too strict, not enough strict, you know, or not as strict. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, we, to me, it all goes back to personal responsibility. And I think all of us have a, have a responsibility um, in terms of, you know, how we address our, with our families <clears throat> um, doing our part, um, you know, to protect our neighbors, protect our business, our fellow, you know, our, friends that own businesses, um, our, our doctors, um, you know, our firefighters. I've, I have a um, firefighter who lives on my street just a few doors down and, and um, you know, he's, he's encountered corona cases. He's encountered, you know, everything on the face of the earth. Um, and I think, you know, we have to do what we can the best way we know how to, um, you know, to, you know, to help, to help our, our neighbors and our friends. And, and we have to remember at the end of the day, you know, government's not going to solve every single problem. I mean, most of the, I think, um, you know, solutions to the future of how we address COVID-19, 
not just now, but I think into the future and under the new economy, mm-hmm. it's all going to be driven by the, it's all going to be driven by, you know, the, the private sector and, 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 and leaders who have a capitalist capitalistic mindset, I think in terms of working together and, and, and partnering with government, I think they have those solutions. Um, and I think that's kind of the balance that even under these dire times, um, I think everybody really, you know, is, is, is kind of challenged with because I don't think anybody wants to give up their constitutional rights to what they believe in. Um, right. You know, just like, like you and I, I mean, you know, we're strong, very strong supporters of the Second Amendment and, you know, we, and, and how we feel about work, our beliefs, you know, related to our guns and our weapons. Um, and, and, and not to get off on a tangent on, you know, on, on, on the second amendment issue, but I think there's, there's some, there, there are some themes from a constitutionality perspective that, um, I think has to be balanced as we kind of go through, um, you know, this, this world we're living in right now. But, um, I think it is the government's job to make sure that, you know, our fellow, our fellow neighbors are, are safe and they're protected, um, and, and then I think that's where the rest of the community and the business community and everybody else, we all need to come together and rally around each other to um, continue to be resilient and fight, um, you know, what's for, for what's best for um, all of our communities. Yeah. Especially here I, in West Georgia. I think, I think the, uh, some of the politics you see on social media right now is, <coughs> Excuse is me. very, very interesting. Um, <laughs> Uh, and to see what the, the small pieces that they're fighting about, and I understand that those small pieces are important because they're they're important to a, a whole, as the Constitution goes. Um, in my in my view, you know, this is this is completely. A lot of people are trying to relate this to that I've seen are trying to relate this to like nine eleven, where you know they started took, taking parts of our security. Uh, for and switching it out for freedoms, um, and and we could argue that you know all day long till we're blue in the face. But I don't think this is a I don't think this is a security issue. This is a health issue. So it's a, it's different. It's something that, like you said, we haven't had to deal with this in our lifetime. I know, you know, 100 years ago or so, they they had the Spanish flu. Well, this you can't really relate it because we're in a completely different time. Our technology is totally different. Our innovation is totally different. Um, our country is totally different. So, heck, the world is, for that matter. It, it, it's a completely different time, so we can't relate these things. So we're learning these new things and how, how we're able to apply the Constitution, how we're able to apply technology. Um, it's, it's all new for everybody. So it's, it's Well, it's unpredictable. It's I mean, I think, unpredi- as, yeah. as, I think as, we, as we heard the, the GEMA director of Georgia say, you know, once a couple of weeks ago, it's one thing with a hurricane – you yeah, know, maybe want to hit the coast of Georgia, you know, there's, there's a level of predictability. There's a level of preparedness that you can do. There's a, you know, there are all those things that you can at least plan for. Not every plan you, is perfect. You know what they, yeah, you know what you need to bring in afterwards, you know? Right. And, and so in this situation, I, I don't think this is not comparable at all because you, you just don't know. And, and, no. and we don't know if, you know, there's, there's a community somewhere in the state that's going to, you know, eventually flare up and be another, you know, unfortunate hotspot. I mean, we, we see what, you know, a lot of the, the, the tragedy is going on in, in all of our counties where lives have been lost. Um, but, you know, places like Albany, Georgia, where it's second per, you know, second per capita yeah. in the entire United States of number of um, COVID-19 cases. And, and I think it's still um, up there in the top two of, of um, you know, deaths because of it, which is just tragic. And I think our understanding of how we, you know, we, we go through this. And again, it's a day by day situation um, of, of how we make things a little bit better. And, and I think in, in some communities, it's, you know, how, how do we make things a little bit easier for our, our community and our neighbors, um, you know, every single day. And it's not going to happen all at once. It's, it's very incremental. And I think we have to just go yeah. back to, um, you know, just keeping that in mind and being very, I think, very sensitive to everybody's situation because everybody's situation is completely, is completely different. So. Okay. I like, I, I like that. I mean, it's, it is, it is what it is and we just have to deal with it day by day, right. sometimes hour by hour, minute by minute. Uh, so let me see one of, one of my last questions here. Do you see anything 
that this is emergency has exposed that we could do without in the future. Do without in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Not something that we want to take forward with <clears throat> us. It's kind of the opposite. Hey, this has been exposed. What could we do without? I, I'll be honest, Andy, it's probably a little early, I think, to, to, to answer that question. I don't know that we know yet if there's something that we could do without it until I think there's, there's more data. And I'm not talking about the actual specific um, health-related component or public health-related component of this, but, um, but I think in, t in terms of the bigger picture of care, access, um, you know, essential necessities to keep people alive um you know and then you have kind of the rest of our the rest of our economy that you know touches on education business and everything else um i i don't know that there's something that you know necessarily could be quote unquote you know left without or taking out um you know kind of in, in some ways i think i don't want to say necessarily that like naturally if, if there are things that are taken out, maybe naturally that would happen, but I, I yeah. think it's too early to really answer that or, or, or there may not be anything. Um, I think we, all we can focus on right now is kind of what's in front of us day to day and, um, you know, and, 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 and see where, see where all of this takes us. Right. Right. And I, I look at things a lot of times, especially business wise is uh, how can we uh, simplify things and a lot of times simplifying things, means you're taking stuff away, stuff that isn't essential. There's our buzzword for 2020, essential. <laughs> uh, everything appears to be essential, but I think, I think you're, we will re review that word and reprioritize that word, uh, hopefully in the near future, so that we really realize what is essential, uh, not necessarily business-wise, but in our own personal lives. Well, and I, um, yeah, and I, and I think the danger of, there, I think there's one danger with, you know, the overuse of essential it's, it's 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 starting to pit people against each other saying you know andy you're better than me because you know of some situation or yeah. you know and, and and i and i think that um yeah you know, i've a friend of mine and a, and a neighbor and um you know he you know he he owns a business and i think he he could give a pretty strong debate as to whether his business is is really essential or not and and i think that um I think there's kind of essential related to, you know, the emergency situation, but I think in some ways, you know, words, words could be overused and, and start creating a different dynamic. Maybe that is not necessarily intended to, to create. And so, well, I, I mean, as a real estate agent, I know my business, real estate as a business is essential. People still need housing in this, um, but not, everything we're learning not absolutely everything we do is essential all the time and and i i got to tiptoe around that because i would have agents tell argue with me that everything we do is essential and i i, I think this can apply to many other businesses i've changed my practices where you we may not be showing houses we get a we get a photographer in there to take pictures do a 3d tour and that's how you show a house. I mean, so we're learning what is essential or there may be things that we can, like I said, strip down, remove, simplify it and go into the future. And I think a lot of times this is probably what's going to happen from now on is that we're going to have this stuff going forward. And you may not, you may not be showing houses quite as much as we used to. We may be doing this all more virtually now. Um, that's totally a possibility. There's nothing, I, I like to tell my buyers that, you know, hey, look, it's the feeling of a house. A lot of times when they go into a house, it may not be what they think they want, but it's a feeling that they get in the house. And right. does that relate on a 3D tour virtually done? <laughs> Probably not, but. Well, and, 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 I'll get, and I'm gonna throw something out here too, as our, I know we're almost near our time, but the other part of this too, is we kind of go back to the school discussion we were having. I mean, you know, there, there's also this whole element that, you know, there are a lot of kids in our community that relied on our schools because, you know, it was, it was their, it was their safe place. It was their outlet that, you know, they could um, literally cry for help if they needed help. Right. Um, and in terms of getting mental health 
help or support, um, trying to get one of their parents or guardians help or support. Those things have been kind of, I don't want to say eliminated, but there are now barriers in place because of being in this virtual environment that maybe not yeah. necessarily happen as frequently. And so I just, you know, want to be, you know, to everybody who watched this video or whatever, just be mindful that um, of what's going on, I think, and, in, in, you know, with our kids and our neighbors from that point perspective, but also, um, you know, individuals or families who maybe even need help from a, from a domestic violence perspective, because I know statistics um, and numbers have shown just over the last couple of weeks, there's been a, you know, increase in domestic violence cases across the state, 15, some, some places 20%. And I think as we kind of look at, you know, how we're going kind of every day, we, we need to think about into the future is, is preparing, um, you know, and, and having ways to where there are outlets for um, people to get this information. And I'll share some links with you and some, some other information that um, maybe you and others can post, um, you know, if somebody's in a situation and they need, they need help or support. But how, how do we um, really reach those that, um, you know, don't have that outlet or can't, or can't get to, get to a safe place? Um, right. and, that, and, th and those individuals we need to really think about. And if, and if we hear about that in the community, I think, I think we need to do our part. And I think we need to, we need to speak up and, and help uh, yeah, those that can't help, each other, help themselves. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I have a neighbor that's a police officer in, in another county. And, and he has mentioned that before to some other neighbors that the, the news hasn't really caught on to the, those increasing numbers for um, domestic issues uh, because people are staying at home more. Um, they're, they're probably drinking more <laughs> because hey, it's like a working staycation. That's what I've basically been calling it. And, and you know, sometimes this stuff exposes things that, uh, that we don't realize that have been ignored. And I would hope that most people can work through these things, um, but right. you know, we will have to deal with that. And yeah, definitely shoot me the links. I will add them into this post when we do the video and everything. Okay. So that we can get that help for anybody who needs it. I have a, a friend uh, in the neighborhood who, who has lost his, his brother this week or last week um, oh, wow. for, for, for suicide. So that's something that we, uh, we all struggle uh, with, whether it's us directly or family members or friends. So it's, it's something we do have to keep an eye on. I'm glad you brought that up. I really appreciate that. Um, so, so I guess two last questions. Basically, you're running for office. Give me your, your, your elevator speech to anybody that, who may uh, be considering voting for you. Um, and I say elevator speech, <laughs> so can try to keep it short. No soapbox elevator speech this time. Um, and what you guys, what you're doing for your campaign and all this, uh, as far as meeting with folks and everything. And then obviously your social media website uh, and contact right. info for, for your campaign. Go. Yeah. So, I mean, real quick. Um, I need everyone's support, help, vote. Um, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll be frank. I, I am going to fight for you. I am going to work for you. I am going to get the job done. Um, there are too many needs. There's too many challenges that we have here in West Georgia. And it's time that we start pushing the ball forward. And it's time, it's time for our part of the state to, you know, truly have a seat at the table um, and, and, and fight for the economy we deserve, fight for the mental health system we deserve, um, support our school districts and, and keep helping them raise the game of their academics and, and everything from our special needs families to um, greater investments into, into STEM and, and our workforce. But at the same time, not giving up and, and having a leader who's truly going to live out their family values and truly live out and support, make sure that our second amendment is, is fought and somebody's truly going to make sure that president Trump is reelected. So, um, I've been there, I've been to those fights. Um, you know, I know all of us are sick and tired of seeing tax increases. When I was on the school board, we cut taxes for the first time in seven years. Um, and the only way that changes is we have to have a more prosperous, uh, County and a prosperous West Georgia. Um, and I think those things have to change. So um, go to our website, jasonannavatarte.com. We're on Facebook. Um, reach out to us. Um, 
tell us what you think, you know. But um, but at the end of the day, this is this is about the future. This isn't about the past. This is about getting stuff done. And if you have that vision, and and if that's what you want in your next state senator, then I'm your guy. All right, Jason. I really appreciate you know, your time today and your candid discussion, um, folks. He'll listen. Uh, I I had my own concerns and issues with uh, the, the school board. And he listened and was able to help in, in, in a lot of ways uh, to get to the right places. So uh, reach out to him if you got any questions. He's got an open ear. And obviously, he's got time because <laughs> we're sitting <laughs> home. <laughs> so, no, I know you're busy, man. But I, know you, I do know you make time for, for us out here uh, whenever folks have any questions or, or issues or whatnot. So appreciate your time today. Yeah, um, thank you, Andy. Oh, my pleasure, man. Have a great one.